Well, let's uh, switch gears now and, and uh, spend most of the remaining time, not all of it, but most of it, on myelofibrosis, a, clearly a clinical challenge uh, for uh, physicians out there and their, and their patients. And uh, Robin, again, I'm going to start with you, uh, taking advantage of your work uh, looking at symptoms in, in the MPNs. And why don't you tell us about how patients with uh, MF present? Sure. So I think early on, John did a great job of really explaining kind of what happens with the blood counts, where especially in PVET, you're seeing very, very high red count in platelets. In MF, in early stages, you can still see that high red count potentially in high platelets, but you start to see the white count go up, and then over time, you actually start to see the cytopenia start to, to come in, especially thrombocytopenia, anemia. And that really is what clues us in. We also see our markers of inflammation go up, especially CRP. Uh, you can see LDH start to climb up. From a patient perspective, uh, we've shown that the symptoms are also a key thing that goes up when you go into myelofibrosis, and it's been quite interesting where you, in ET, PV, and MF, you start to see sequentially increase uh, in terms of symptom burdens. Um, some of the most common symptoms that I have patients present with, uh, the number one symptom is fatigue. Uh, you also get a lot of constitutional symptoms, so especially uh, uh, fevers, night sweats, those can go up. Uh, abdominal symptoms because the increased frequency of splenomegaly, so early satiety, abdominal discomfort. The other key symptom that we see with this is weight loss uh, in some patients, and we, we do start to see that. We know that that actually can be an adverse prognostic indicator. Um, so it's all things to be aware of in your patients, be monitoring over time. I think that's one key thing that we, is now incorporated in NCCN guidelines as well as kind of key in our practice is that we want to not only get a baseline assessment of symptoms, but see how they're changing over time. You know, one of the challenges though is that a lot of our patients tell us that they're fatigued and usually the doctor in the room rolls their eyes and is like, yeah, me too. Um, but it's really hard to actually measure that because they may say fatigue and then you ask them about their you know, what they're doing their, during their day, and they actually haven't cut back on anything yet, but it's a real event in their lives that they could tell the difference. Any clues that you can give uh, Mary Frances about how to sort through this very important there system? Is, there is the scoring systems, but I, Robin will, I'm sure, address those. Um, but this is a huge difficulty, and certainly at our recent patient meeting, I mean, there were patients who are so eloquent about this fatigue that this is different from being tired at the end of the day. Um, that it completely they have to mo uh, put their life through it and I was very impressed listening to them how how different it is from what we mean by fatigue I think to, to try and measure it is difficult the MSN 10 is probably the most useful thing in that you can do that um, scoring and repeatedly score patients uh, as they come through the clinic um, and that's where we would aspire to, although there's lots of issues about how you get that done and where you store the results and what happens to the results and keeping the whole thing going. But at least it gives you some sort of a measure um, of, for the patients and uh, something that you can repeat if you say give them therapy or see is there a difference. Yeah, just, to, just to remind the group, I mean, when we first embarked on the development of JAK inhibitors, um, no one, you know, we knew that this was a drug that affected, or we believe affected cytokines, which mediate symptoms, and we embarked on trying to figure out how to, how to quantify that. And one of the things we used early on, which I distinctly remember, you know, prior to the, the advent of uh, ruxolinib, is the six-minute walk test. We would have the patients walk back and forth for six minutes, and that was somehow a gauge. I realize now it's totally useless, but that, at that point, that was the technology we used to try to gauge whether someone's you know, overall performance status and their, their energy level and fatigue was improving, but clearly not an effective way. One thing I will say about symptoms is we, we've uh, recently done an interesting analysis of comfort, uh, uh, the comfort studies, and we, we have seen that symptoms actually can be uh, predictive of survival. Uh, the other thing is even just overall quality of life in MF patients is at baseline was predictive of overall survival. So I think that that's something to really keep in mind with your MF patients as well as all your MPN patients, that their quality of life, a lot of times because this is a chronic malignancy, um, is really key to, to our treatment of them and when we're deciding what treatments to give and how to best manage them, making sure that their quality of life is kind of teed up, I think is. The other thing that was interesting that we did was in the Mosaic study where we had uh, controls um, matched controls and we did the MSF10 on the patients and the controls and much to the delight of the patients they score much 
worse on the symptoms than controls. Mm -hmm. So it's more than just, I'm tired. Yes. Good. Well, it, it's an important issue and drives a lot of our decision making in treating this disease. I'm going to come back to your comments about um, ruxolitinib and, um, and uh, fatigue and quality of life and how it might relate to survival too. So we'll come back to that. Mary Frances, uh, tell us about how we make this diagnosis of MS. Okay, so the patient presents with a history examination. Um, splenomegaly is what you're looking for. Many of these patients, are, 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 everybody has apocryphal tales of patients who are referred with a mass, which is actually the spleen. Um, you would then want to quantify, measure the, sp the spleen. We would do an ultrasound, to, it may be a CT scan or an MRI, depending on the practice. Um, I would want then to look at a blood film in particular, uh, look at the blood counts first, looking for anemia and thrombocytopenia, and a blood film for the presence of teardrop cells. Teardrop cells have to be seen if you're making a diagnosis of myelofibrosis. And then these patients, of course, all need a bone marrow done because you need the bone marrow to see the fibrosis. And then I think we're now in the age of molecular testing, obviously JAK2, MIPL and CALR, but also more extensive molecular testing, looking for other mutations that feed into the prognosis or the prognostication.